All right, so this is the moment most of us have been waiting for. The, the denouement, maybe not the denouement, but not that you guys know what that means. Anyway, okay. So here we go. We, after our, um, first of all, by the way, have you guys ever heard of Rav Usher Weiss? Perhaps the greatest, the biggest Tamid Chacham currently alive, biggest Posek. Heard of him? Well, yes, no? him. Yeah, so he, he's a big dude. Um, anyways, I was listening to a shiur of his today, and he was saying how Unklus and Rashi are the two most important Mifarshim on the Torah by a long shot. Really, he said, really, a person should just learn Unklus and Rashi for until he knows I'm cold, and then move on to the other thing. Anyways, so we did Unklus, and now we're on Rashi, and just put this out there, Rashi, most people think Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, but as has been pointed out, it could also be, I mean, that, that is his name. We're not going to pretend that's not his name, but really Rabban Shel Yisrael, right? He is the teacher of all of Israel. And honestly, there is probably no, obviously after Moshe Rabbeinu and maybe Rabbi Udana, see, there's no one who could say, who we could say has been more involved in the Jewish curriculum for everyone than Rashi. It's not even, it's not even a question. It's not even close, honestly. Um, who we got? Charles Saka? Is that what we're looking at here? Nice. Okay. So we're, this is going to be, we're, this is probably going to be a two or more likely three part series. And today we're going to be looking at some of these, uh, some of these uh, bullet points here, some of these uh, yeah, chapter headings, we'll call them. And Hopefully we'll get to we'll get to cover a lot and we'll start addressing the question of Rashi, uh, what what is it, what's his idea of Peshat and how does he go about uh, what does his commentary look like what are the character characteristics, but before we do that we have to understand who Rashi the man was because it's actually extremely important to understand his commentary. So if we have here I need to move you guys here okay if we have Rashi the man. Uh, we have Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. Interestingly, we don't call him Rabbi Shlomo Ben Yitzchak, which is the usual, and he would have been Rashbi if that were the case. And some actually say that the reason why we don't call him that is because we didn't want you to get confused between Rashbi, you know, Rabbi, you know, the famous Rashbi, Bishamon Bar Yochai, and him. So they came up with Rashi instead. Okay, it probably also has to do with the fact that we don't really know much about his dad, so we don't know if he was a Tamil Chacham or not. Oh, Michael Salem. Okay, he's living 1040 to 1105 in early, early Rishon. Born and died in Troyet, which is in northern France. You see it here. Now that's going to be important for us. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit. And basically, this is the travels he did in his life. When he was uh, 18 years old, he traveled to Mainz, which is uh, basically there were three very, very important yeshivot in Germany abbreviated by the Hebrew letters Shin, Vav, and Mem. I forget what the Shin is, um, but Mem is the mines and Verms, which is a Vav in, in, in Hebrew. So first he was in Mainz, and then Mainz, Mainz, I'm not sure. It was the Yeshiva of Rabbeinu Gershom, who was coined by Rashi to be Ma'or HaGola, the light of the exile. He died the same year Rashi was born, Right, so it's like a handing over of the torch. So Rashi never learned with him, but he studied with his son, with his student Rabbi Yaakov ben Yakar. We know that because Rashi mentions him by name in Sanhedrin and Pesachim. And then he eventually also goes to Verms, which is a very famous yeshiva because it was well known for stressing a huge amount of Tanakh. He had to know Tanakh. It wasn't just the yeshiva to study Gemara, and they also were very very makpid to the best they could be of getting correct gear sa'ot and also having, you know, original thinking. It wasn't, it wasn't um, like some of the other yeshivot that were, because again, this is early on. There isn't that, she, there aren't, the she taught of how to learn are still being developed. They're still, you know, so there's no, you know, um, solid way ready. Rashid's family is very enigmatic. We don't know much about his parents or his wife. We don't have any evidence that there are any connection to scholars or rabbinic families, which we'll see later on could factor, uh, you know, be an important factor. He has three daughters, all of them married 
big Talmidei Chachamim, I wrote possibly four because one article I read said they had a fourth daughter that died when she was very young. But so, um, so that's his growing up life. At the age of 30, he comes back. So he goes from France to Germany, um, at, there for 12 years studying. Then he comes back to Troyes, France, France, and becomes the communal rabbi, the Dayan, the Rosh Hashiva, pretty much instantaneously within five years. He, he's, you know, running the show there. Um, but none of these are paid positions like today. And hence the, the idea that Rashi is, is uh, you know, a winemaker. You probably heard that very often, that Rashi was involved in wine, make, wine making and wine selling. Um, apparently, the English word for that is a vintner. I found that out today. Um, uh, but according to Rav Chaim Salvechik, there's no evidence of that. And probably not true because the the climate in Troyes, France is not particularly good for making wine. Um, and so he must have made his uh, money a different way. We don't really know. Um, but it's just interesting that he was the community rabbi down in the and he also made a living, meaning he also was doing something else during that time to make a living. Um, Rashi's yeshiva, him, meaning the one that he was ahead of, started out as very slow, very, you know, like more Shalim, some might say, um, but eventually picked up. And there were three characteristics. Professor Grossman, uh, for those who know Rabbi Yoni Grossman, Rabbi Professor Yoni Grossman, the one that I love, his father was Professor Grossman, who wrote a book on Rashi, did his PhD on Rashi. And he says, based on his research, that the characteristics of that yeshiva were that it was democratic in nature, which means, and this would make sense with Rashi's personal history, that it wasn't like the Babylonian yeshivot, where if you were the son of the Gaon, you had, you know, you were next in line, or if you were, you know, it was all, it, Rashi's yeshiva was a meritocracy, basically. Um, it stressed careful analysis of the text and combining that with obviously Rashi's encyclopedic knowledge so that there was, everything was, well, look at that pasuk over there and compare it and contrast. And then there's Rashi's personality as a leader, as, you know, lover of the Jewish people. Uh, we're going to see that that's going to be one of the distinct characteristics of his perush is actually going to be his, uh, many times he gives B'nai Israel the, we'll call it the benefit of the doubt or the favorable uh, outlook. During all this, while he's doing all this, he wrote his commentaries on the Tanakh and his commentary on most of the Talmud. He also has hundreds of responsa. We have about 300, you know, with us. And we know that there were a lot more because of references. Uh, for example, there are certain Sidurim, Machzor Vitri and Machzor Sidur Shel Rashi, which are written by students, but they quote Rashi's responsa in the commentary. Um, so that's how we know that there's a lot more. Any questions up until now? Yeah. Um, about Ashi's personal life, did he write about his personal life or somebody else did? Well, we know from, we know, we know, again, first of all, we don't know a lot. And second of all, we know about his daughters because they married. We know that Rabbi Utam was his grandson and that Ashbam was his grandson. So we know about their fathers and we know that that's how they, yeah. Um, other than that, we don't know much. We know, um, he makes reference to sometimes in his perush to his teachers. And I'm not sure uh, where or how we know that he traveled to mines and then to worms, but that's, we, we do know that. That is probably, that's not so crazy. That's probably just based off of comments he said about who his teachers were. And then we, we you know, put the pieces together. Um, again, writing wasn't texting, you know, having text wasn't such a, wasn't such a thing. So to find stuff uh, was not so common. But we know a lot. Okay, especially for someone that lived so long ago. I mean, he's not that much after Saadia, of Saadia, and we barely we knew much less about of Saadia. And we're gonna see why that is the case. Now, what's the setting he's growing up? So unlike Rav Saadia that we just mentioned, she's growing up completely Christian context. Now, if you go back to the map, this map is gonna be very important because, like I told you, France was Christian. But southern France and northern Spain was always this buffer zone. It was a quasi, it was an area where the Muslims and the Christians intersected. 
where there was some level of communication. Those, the people that that area produces are, are very, very uh, unique. The Radak, the Ramban, those people have a very interesting fusion of the Christian and Muslim uh, philosophy. But Rashi is completely in a Christian context. Um, and that's, it, it's important. So this is uh, important to keep in mind. So, um, well, the setting he grew up in uh, and is working in is during a mini, it's not the Renaissance, it's gonna take place in the 14 and 1500s, but it's a mini Renaissance amongst the, um, the Christian group that he's, you know, the Christian church that is getting bigger and more uh, established. They're trying to now reinvigorate the study of the, the Bible. And it's also coming with a very spiritual desire to reawaken the, you know, Renaissance means like the reawakening, like the, the, the rebirth. So it's a, they wanted to try and bring back the reverence that should have for the Bible and the word of God. And there was a big push towards trying to have a very literal understanding of the Torah to try and, and amongst Christians. And um, they were going to use the power of the church to enforce that. And that combined with the fact that Jews were uh, by and large and now interacting with non-Jews, Christians, on a more economic and commercial level, um, creates some level of interaction and in that the Jews are now becoming exposed to these, some of these ideas. Now, Rashi himself overall didn't have any anti-Semitic, I mean, I'm sure he had anti-Semitic, but he wasn't the subject of a pogrom or anything like that, but his, um, his teacher, I, didn't, I don't know why that's like that, but his teacher was the was his teacher's family was killed in a program and the first crusade began in Rashi's lifetime. So it's something that is constantly on his mind and it's maybe even a little bit more worrisome is that nothing is predictable. It could just happen out of nowhere that boom, new king or new decree and something happens. We're going to see in a lot of his comments, Rashi isn't the biggest fan of the Goyim. And this is, you know, his cultural uh, upbringing and historical setting is certainly a good reason why? Um, Takes it out on Esav. Yeah, well, Esav represents all. Look, Esav is portrayed even in the Pshat Mikra. Even if you want to say he's not such a bad guy in the Pshat, he's still an ag very aggressive person in the Pshat, a very physically aggressive and uh, maybe even a bully in a certain sense. Just from the way he talks, the way the Torah describes him, Vayochal, Vayesh, Vayakom, Vayelach, Vayibez Esav. It's like a very aggressive language. Um, so it, that's what he's feeling, you know. That's what. Right, but any chance he gets, he. Takes yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So now let's just talk about before we talk about what we're really here to talk about, which is his commentary on the Torah. We've got to first talk about his other work, which is his commentary on the Talmud. It's on thirty out of thirty-nine Masechtot. He died. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't finish the whole thing. As you have all studied, you know that it's very locally oriented. I mean, he does reference other sukyot, but that's not primarily how he is mifaresh any given thing. He wants you to understand the sukya as it appears here without necessarily referencing other pieces of uh, Gemara. And the, only, the best way to see that is to contrast him with Tosafot, with almost every comment is contrasting it with a different Gemara and coming out with the Terut. Rashi, and most of, not most, but many times the Tosafot point of departure is Rashi explained it here this way, but in, you know, a different Gemara, that doesn't work, right? He's a Mifaresh, not a Posek, again, somewhat in contrast to the Tosafot. And as you all know, by far the most essential tool for anyone learning Talmud, uh, at least until, you know, maybe Steinsaltz and, uh, and Schottenstein came out, certainly Rashi, although even there, 99% of their comments are just summaries of what Rashi has already said. Um, Something that we don't often appreciate is his, uh, I forgot which Hebrew poet was once, like a secular guy, was once, they asked him, who has the nicest Hebrew of, any, of anyone you've ever, who has the best Hebrew of anyone you've ever read? And his answer was, it's a tie between Rashi and the Rambam. And this is a secular poet. So unparalleled mastery of Hebrew, but also French. I've... Uh, read that people that study French 
non-Jewish people in a university who want to study medieval French, why they want to do that, I'm not sure. They use Rashi's, they learn Rashi. They learn Rashi and La'aze Rashi to understand medieval, you know, what certain words meant. Um, brevity with the utmost clarity it speaks for itself. This is something that we never, personally, I've never appreciated, but it's fascinating. When you read Rashi's commentary, you get to realize that not only did he have an understanding of all the Torah, all of the Midrash Chazal, all of the, 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 the literature up until his day, but he was also a Baki in all of these industries. If you read it, it's as if he's an expert in all of these industries, and he's able to be Mifaresh, the Gemarot, according to, uh, like, giving you the insight as to all of these things. And, and these are not just like, you know, things that would be next to each other, right? Winemaking, animal husbandry, like how animals mate, agriculture, clothing, clothing manufacturing. And whether or not he just, out of his own curiosity, picked these things up, or because he knew, well, the Torah talks to me about, you know, Isurim with regards to Shatnez. I need to know how this stuff is made. And then went out of his way to learn about it or with banking or, you know, all these different things. Avodah um, Zarah, he knew the procedures at local fairs. He knew the, the way the fairs would work and how it would affect the Avodah Zarah practices and all these things. He was, it was, it's an amazing thing that you never really, you take it for granted. But you don't realize he, that, that's time and effort put into learning just about the subject matter before you even learn about how it applies to making to, to, to the Torah law, which is just incredible. I mean, personally, I never really appreciated it. And this is a longer list. I just didn't want to continue writing the whole thing. Um, and then lastly, which I think is an important contrast to the Rambam, who will also call him a master educator, but in a very different way. Learning Rashi on the Gemara, and it's similar to some, somewhat similar also in his Perush on the Torah, he really gives you the, the, the most and the least amount of information you need in order to figure it out yourself. He's never pampering you. Anyone who's learned the Rashbam on Pesachim can immediately see the difference between him and his grandfather, right? Rashbam and his grandfather. Rashi gives you the most information you'll need and the least amount of information you'll need to figure out exactly what's going on if you read him carefully and if you read the Gemara carefully. And that's very much in contrast to the Rambam, who basically, I don't want to you know, make it as if they're two polar opposites, but really his philosophy was, also, I'm going to give you the least amount of information, but he really wanted to, in a sense, sp you know, spoon feed it to you a little bit more than Rashi. Rashi still, because he's working off the Talmud, really wants to make you still work for it and, and, and go through it, whereas the Rambam really in a certain sense, wants to replace the Talmud with his, own, with his own writing. So that's an interesting highlight, maybe an important difference, although I, it might be that I'm making the difference bigger than it needs to be, but it also has to do with the, perhaps the cultural background difference. Okay, now we're on to the commentary of the Tanakh, and here we get to the real meat and potatoes. So by far, I think we could all be agreed upon that since the Talmud, it is the most influential work. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that necessarily practically it's changed the lives of how I behave on a daily basis. It's not al book. However, if you ask people about their understanding about Torah, you go around to the average person who's had any education, far and away, 99% of people, they're working with a Chumash Rashi understanding. It's almost become synonymous, Chumash Rashi. It's almost as been as if the commentary became the text itself. Um, so much so that it has more super commentaries on it, almost as many as the Torah itself, which means to say that it's all, there's almost as many commentaries on Rashi's commentary than there are on the thing that Rashi himself is commenting on. And there's more commentaries on Rashi than any other book in Jewish history, obviously aside from the Talmud, but that's to ex be expected especially since it was around for several hundred years before, and it's more about uh, daily practice, and it's much bigger. But that just gives you a, a sense of what kind of work we're dealing with here. It, it's, it's unparalleled. The influence that it's had just in the, on, the, on creating the minds, generations after generations after generations of Jewish knowledge shaped by his, by his book. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons why. It's, it was the first Hebrew book ever printed. 
first Hebrew book ever printed was Chumash Rashi. And it caught like wildfire immediately, which ended up resulting in hundreds of different manuscripts because it became part of the education and everyone has a copy of it. And everyone's adding their own notes and then passing it on to their students. And, you know, we're going to see also that Rashi's style is to quote Midrashim, but sometimes to change a word or to paraphrase it. And so people who then learned the Midrash and the original thought Rashi made a mistake and then changed the back. And so a lot of times you'll see large pieces of Rashi's commentary in parentheses or something. And it's not like a one word difference or a two word difference. Sometimes it's a huge, it's a huge amount of text that's actually uh, omitted in some text and, and included in others. Um, what's fascinating about Rashi and probably will not be the case for almost any other book in Jewish history is this. Whoa, wait. Immediately accepted amongst Ashkenaz and Sephardic Jewry. Now, to give you an appreciation of this statement, even the Jews of Yemen, who are Arabic-speaking Jews, and who are completely cut off from all the rest of Jewry, and who were learning Sa'ad Yagaon's tafsir that we talked about last week, the translation, that was their bread and butter for hundreds of years. As soon as they got Rashi's perush on the Torah, they immediately designated that Chumash Rashi was necessary to be memorized, and the tafsir was secondary. Yemen, you're talking about Yemen. You could not find a, a, a Yemenite person is the most opposite person from a person who grew up in Northern France. And yet immediately upon receiving it, um, they, they instituted that every, all the schools had Rashi, Chumash Rashi as part of their curriculum. One of the reasons for its huge, you know, rise is because there's a chayuv of Shnai Mikra Ve'echad Targum. And as the Shukhan Ruch brings down, could be accomplished with Perush Rashi. That doesn't, that doesn't explain it enough. We're going to have to go into more. Edward. Yeah. You're saying it, it, um, it became popular in Yemen after the printing press or before? No, meaning I, I, doubt, it got to, I doubt it got there. Um, I'm assuming that after it got there, it became, it, you know, whether or not that was a hand copy first, but... Within, with, after, a, after a century, a century after Rashi was, had, had passed away, it was, he was already out there. So before the printing press, but I'm sure the printing press just made it, you know, all the more so. But it was even before the printing press. Um, there's a 500-year difference between him, I think, and the printing press. What was that? I think there's like a 500-year difference between... 400-year difference, yeah. 400, the printing press is not till the late 1400s. This is in 14, um, this is in 1534, I believe, this first Hebrew book ever printed. I think that's the year. Um, now, this is something, this is probably the most important thing we've seen up until now. And it's not appreciated, especially by us, because we usually think or conceive of Rashi as being the Midrash guy, right? Unfortunately, that's our... Uh, warped conception of him. However, when Rashi was creating his commentary, he was actually the pshat guy. And what do I mean by that? Is that up until his day, all of Torah commentary in Ashkenazic lands was dominated by two schools of thought. One is called the Darshanim, and many times Rashi will actually quote, did it in this last week's parasha a bunch, Rabbi Moshe HaDarshan. You've seen him quote this, yeah? Rabbi Moshe HaDarshan, Ra'iti b'sid yisodo shel Rabbi Moshe HaDarshan. A lot of times it's, he breaks up words. He'll take a word and be like, Eluze, he'll break up a word there. He did it with, um, no, he does it with Cheta uh, Egel. He does it, we just saw one a couple, maybe two weeks ago with, oh, Para Aduma. He takes every piece of the Para Aduma and gives it a symbolic meaning as it relates to Egel Azahab. Right? And that's all based off Rabbi Moshe Adarsha. Um, and that was the level of Drasha not caring for what we'll call Pshat. It was purely Drashot. It was for Drashot, to make Drashot and Shul, but also to, to write down Drashot to inspire people to give them interesting meanings, but not being anchored to the Pshat. The other school of thought, um, and this is by 
Menachem uh, Barchel, who Rashi also sometimes quotes. Now there's two Menachems that he quotes. That you have to be very careful. Sometimes it's Menachem Ben Saruk, who he'll quote Menachem the Chiber, the Chibur. He called Menachem Chiber X Y Z. He was a grammarian, and this guy also Menachem Barchel was also really a grammarian, but grammarian. But he quotes him as being Menachem Patar. Sometimes also you'll see that, and he's basically just a um, only like a nitpicker for words and explaining certain words. But there was no one who was trying to use Midrash to explain Pshat and to get to Pshat. There was either Darshanim or people were just trying to explain what words mean, in the individual words, but not really trying to give you a whole sense of what Rashi will call Pishutoshel Makra, or even better is, um, uh, where is it? Here, Mashmaut Mikra, right? The what is the the sense of the, the of the of the crowd? What is the uh, the flavor, the taste that you get? So Rashi is revolutionary in that sense, and we usually don't appreciate that. And we're going to see that that is going to be the crux of Rashi's perush. One of the most important things is going to be balancing this, this dichotomy here. Um, and then obviously he changed the landscape of all future parashan. Once his commentary was written, everyone after him, after him had to address Rashi's commentary. Even the Ibn Ezra who lived contemporaneously with him, Rashi's commentary came out first and he has to, he calls him parashan data, right? Based off of the, uh, it's not exactly the most, uh, right? It's one of the sons of Haman, Ved parashan data, but it's a play on the word parashan and dat, which is religion. So Parshandata, he calls him as a way of, it's a praise, even though the character might not be such a good. Anyways, and also highly unappreciated is the influence it had on Christians. Many, we have many Christians who wrote at the time that they would learn the Bible with the Hebrew uh, explanation, the Hebrew's explanation, and their references to Rashi, based on how we know that they quote it, it was considered the authoritative rabbinic uh, interpretation of Torah. So, let's talk about some of the characteristics of the commentary. Wait, why would they learn with Rashi if, if Rashi hates them? They wanted to know what the Torah meant. They were very, they were called uh, Hebraists. They were Christians who really wanted to understand the original text. And Rashi's commentary to them was the understanding of the text according to the rabbinical mind, which would then give them an insight into how the people around the time of Jesus were understanding the Torah, right? Which would be important to them because, again, these people were, like we said in the beginning, they wanted to go back to the originals. They wanted to go back to the original text without, you know, un and just understand, read it and understand it on a simple level. But a lot of times the grammar was, uh, you know, foreign to them, the language foreign to them. They don't know any of the background. And Rashi provides that better than anyone else. So, um, fine. So the first characteristic of Rashi's commentary, and this is going to be probably the best explanation for why it catches like wildfire, is that 90% of it, nah, maybe not 90%, 75% of it is him quoting or paraphrasing or rewording or just uh, making hints at rabbinic prior pre-existing rabbinic works, whether it's midrash, agadar, halakha, whether it's mishnayot, whether it's gemarot, whether it's random mem memrot of chazal, but the entire almost the entire endeavor of Rashi is to just take the words of chazal, take the the spirit of chazal, and just infuse it into the Torah as a seamless, uh, you know, continuum. You just read the Torah. What does this mean? Chazal, next, next pasuk. You go, and it just flows, feel, flows beautifully. That's number one. Number two is what Rashi calls Pishuto Shel Nekra. He wants to tell you what the Pishuto Shel Nekra is. And essentially, the question becomes, okay, there's a lot of Memrat of Chazal. How do you decide which, which ones you pick to explain any given pasuk? And we're going to get into that, hopefully. I don't know how much time we got. What time is it? Okay, we got time. Good. Um, then we have Rashi as a person and his humility. We have many times Rashi will say, he does it in 
last week's parasha. He says, I don't know. He just says, Lo yadati, right? He says it in last week's parasha. I don't know. I don't know what this is coming to teach me. That's very rare. You don't usually see that. Usually they'll just leave it blank. <laughs> they don't know it. They don't comment on it. But Rashi says, I don't know. He wants you to know that I didn't forget to comment on it. I just don't know what it is. Now that's very, that's very unique. Um, and it's also, until now we have Unkulus and Rav Saadia. We don't know much about Rav Saadia's uh, commentary on the, on the, um, you know, his uh, shahar, it's called, right? The actual commentary. We know more about the tafsir. But really, we don't have anyone saying, this is my opinion, right? It's really just translating the words or giving the explanations of the words. It's not like Nir Ali. And Rashi, from the outset, is already introducing his voice into the biblical, into the, into the you know, the commentary. Another reason Rashi took off is because he's commenting for all levels of Jewish knowledge. Now, this is something that we could really appreciate today is that maybe Rashi is the greatest example of something that's Shaveh Lechol Nefesh. You wouldn't give most five-year-olds Mishneh Torah and say, here, figure this out, or maybe seven-year-olds, right? But pretty much, no matter how wise or old you are, you're learning Chumash Rashi. I know Rabbi Luf still learns it every single week, and I know that they teach it in first grade. So it's, it's a Mamash Shaveh Lechol Nefesh. We talked about this one, Israel and the other nations. And then there are some times where, just like Saadia had with the Karaim, uh, Rashi will have certain statements which seem to be what we'll call polemics against the Christians, or as Isaac said, he hates Esav. Okay, now let's get to some examples. Here we go. Rashi's commentary is a hybrid. What do we mean by that? This, this combination here trying to walk the fine line between drash, we call it midrash, and pshutosh el mikra. So let's look at an example here. Vayomer melech mitzrayim lam yaledot ha'ivriyot. Okay, right in the beginning of Sefer Shemot. This is from Masechet Sota, Dafir Alaf Amud Bet. Rav Shmuel, Chadamar Isha Ubita, Chadamar Kalava Chamota. One said it was a woman and her daughter. It one said it's a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. The one who says it's daughter and mother, that must mean Yocheved and Miriam. So everyone agrees that Yocheved is the mother-in-law or the mother is one of them. And the question is whether or not it's Aharon's wife, Elisheva, or if it's Miriam. Now, if we learned Rashi, you know, Chumash Rashi, we would never know this Machlok it existed. We would just know that it's Yocheved and Miriam. <laughs> we don't know the other... So already Rashi is, in his commentary, is picking one side of the Machloket. Okay, now why did he do that? Because the Gemara is going to continue with that opinion as the one, um, as, as if that's the one, because it says, Tanya kimanda amar, right? So there's a Braita that supports one of the opinions. Isha bita, ditanya shifra zo yochevet, velama nikra shima shifra, shemishaferet et havlad, she makes the, the, the newborn beautiful. Mishaperet, like improves it, makes it, makes it beautiful. Davar acher, another possible explanation. Shifra, sheparu v'ravu Yisrael biyameha. Another reason she might have been called Shifra is because they increased in, abund in abundance in her days. Two explanations for the name Shifra. Pu'a zer miriam, v'la manikra shema pu'a, shaita pu'a, right, which is a way of Rashi on that, tells us pu'a is to like ku. Not to coo, to like goo goo gaga. Okay? Davar acher pu'an shaita po'a b'ruach ha-kodesh. She would speak or scream out in ruach ha-kodesh, atida imi shetiled ben Moshe al-eti She used to scream out, my mom is going to give birth to the Savior of Israel. That's the Gemara. Rashi an chumash, shifra zo yochevet, Hashem shemeshaperet et vlad. Completely takes out the other possible explanation. Okay, also completely takes out the second explanation that she was declaring, uh, you know, Ruach HaKodesh, that the mom's going to give birth. Rashi is picking, he's, he's quoting Chazal, but he's not quoting the whole thing of Chazal. He's choosing his rabbinic interpretation. He's taking the Gemara, and we could discuss why he's doing it. I think it's pretty obvious because the context of the Torah is about ha'ivriyot. This 
these two reasons, Shemeshaperet et Avlad and Shaita Po'a, right? Umotziot et Avlad. Those are, the, first of all, they're in common with each other, whereas the other ones are not, right? Paru v'ravu has nothing to do with atida imi shetelet ben. They're not in common with each other. And also, the context of the Pesukim seem to indicate that they have, if those aren't their real names, that they're called that because of their function as a mialedet. The other ones don't have anything to do with that. I mean, paru v'ravu is nice, but it's not, it's biameha, it's not because she was a mialedet. And also, it's nothing to do with their function as a mialid. So, one example of Rashi's selectivity. Now, if you just, this is a great quote, um, despite my awful underline, um, I think it might be worth reading the whole thing. So, it is quite logical that his goal was not simply to write a commentary, but rather to expound the text in accordance with the rabbinic sources. He had in mind to create a running commentary drawn from the vast, variegated, and sometimes mutually exclusive rabbinic observations. However, he is not an anthologist. An anthologist would have just told you, would have quoted this entire Gemara. We just said, here's my entire Gemara. Figure it out yourself. His material is highly selective, carefully winnowed, and meticulously work, reworked based upon the problem of the in its content. But he is no slavish copier. He's not sloppy. Intellectually daring and independence of mind are striking original features, dot, 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 okay? And now he says like this, there's some 300 instances in his comments on the, on the Torah when he does not accept an inter interpretation of the rabbinic sa sages and says so. Yani he quotes the Chachamim and says, I don't accept that. We'll see, another, we'll see one, I think, in the next slide. It is not that Rashid rejects, in principle, the Midrashic or homiletic interpretation. On the contrary, he certainly agreed with it, but... And then he goes and says that you're going to have a contrast, you're going to have a, what's called a conflict, sorry, between two rabbinic rules. One is, and the other one is, one, the mikra, shivim, you know, the, what we now call shivim panim Torah, which is, based off of the pasuk, right? That God said one thing and I heard two, which is that the words of Torah are like a hammer on an anvil. Right, you hit it and dozens of sparks fly out. That's the words of Torah. Those two things are contradictory. And we'll call it Shivim Panim La Torah are contradictory. Rashi wants to make them no longer contradictory by saying, there's a bunch of Midrashic material. Look at the Gemara Sota. I'm going to take the one that's the most shot and tell you that that's the shot. Here's one example. We're going to see more. Yeah, understood what, what, what we're saying here? Good. We need another example. Here, here we go, another example. So first, here we go. Rashi's mission statement. Two places, he gives us a mission statement. This will make it clear. So also, by the way, Rashi didn't write a hakdama. He did for Shira Shirin. It's like six lines, but it's a hakdama. He didn't write a hakdama for his commentary on the Torah. But he has here. Right, Bereshit, after they eat from the tree, Right, so a, a ton of problems with this pasuk that is ripe for rabbinic, you know, to jump all over this, right? What does it mean? His voice was mitalech bagan leruach hayom. What does that mean? And why are they hiding from a sound? How do you hide from a sound? And what does it mean? Mipenei Hashem Elohim. And how do you hide betoch etzagan? You can't hide inside of a tree. It's just a lot of stuff going on here that is just you know, the Chachamim could go wild on this. And this is what Rashi says. There's a lot of Midrash on this. They already wrote what they wrote in those books. I came to this work. Okay. I came to explain Peshuto Shel Mikra and to quote Agadot that work with the Pshat, meaning that, that explain the Pshat in its best way. And he explains it. This is a Lama, it shouldn't be there. They heard the voice of God, that, the, which voice was going throughout the Gan. It was echoing throughout the Gan. Okay? So here you have Rashi saying, there's plenty of Midrashim I could choose, but guess what? I'm not going to choose any of them because then none of them feel 
to me that they relate to the pshat. And therefore, he just says, I'll tell you what the mashma'ut, again, mashma'ut, what the, the, what is the, when I read the words, what feeling do I get? What, what, you know, what, um, what do I hear? That's how he explains it. He says it again in Akdama to Shira Shirim. Now, interestingly, Shira Shirim is where he puts the Akdama because Shira Shirim really doesn't have any level of pshat, or maybe it does, but it's really not the main level is not its pshat. The main level is its midrash, is its symbolic meaning. And so there, Davka, he says, This is a pasuk, right? God said one thing and I heard two. And he says, One pasuk, and listen to the Lashon, can go into many different ta'amim, flavors, can have many different, uh, we'll say, meanings. But at the end of the day, Pasuk cannot leave its, its intent. It's, it's, it's Pishuto and Mashmao. No real way to translate that. And then he says here that especially in Shira Shirim, there's a lot of Midrashim. And I said, Midrash, Midrash, Ish, Ish, Go on and basically divide the midrash, midrashim and you know characterize them, but only the ones that are going to be mefaresh, the pasuk, um, you know, peshutosh mikra. Okay, we'll do one more. Perhaps the best, the best example of this is in Parashat Shemot. Again, we're going to see Rashi has a choice between two different midrashim, and he actively chooses one because it's more pshat in the pasuk, based off of a lot of different things. So, Shemot Parashat B'Shalach, Perek Tetvav. You know what, actually? Yeah, we'll do this one. Vayasa Moshe et Yisrael miyamsuf, vayitzu abin barshu, vayechu shosh namim banbar v'lo matzu mayim. Moshe vayasa. Now, vayasa means he caused them to travel. This is after the splitting of the sea. Moshe caused the people to move from Yamsuf. Midrash number one says, Vayasa Moshe et Yisrael, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, Al pi ha-givura nasao, Shiken matzinu b'shnayim u'shlosha mekomot shelo nasu el al pi ha-givura, Vekan no nasu el al pi ha-givura. Uma tamud amar Vayasa Moshe. So first of all, he says, Don't think that the people here didn't travel based off of God's words, Al pi ha-shem yahanu v'al pi ha-shem yisao, Because it says Vayasa Moshe. Don't think that. Rather, what is Vayasa Moshe coming to teach us? Uma tamud amar Vayasa Moshe et Yisrael, Okay? Basically saying this pasuk is to tell you the praise of Israel that they were, they didn't say, we're leaving Yamsuf, where, where, where are we going? We needed, we're in the middle of a desert, what are we going to do? They just went, that's Midrash number one. Midrash number two, Midrash Tanchuma. Vayasa Moshe, ma'u vayasa Moshe, she hisi'an ba'al korhan, shelo betovatan. Moshe had to rip them away from Yamsuf, had to drag them away against their will. Ketzad, why? Besha'a, uh, I don't know what that Ela is there. Okay, Ele, sorry. No, I don't know. Paro wanted to get the B'nai, catch B'nai Israel. So he knew that what did he have to do to entice the people to chase B'nai Israel? He loaded all the chariots with diamonds and gold and all that stuff. Now it happens. They drown in the sea. And all the jewels are floating onto shore. We'll go to the, you know, get to the sea and get a nice prize. Once Moshe saw this, he said, what do you think? Every day you're just going to, life is about collecting treasure? Yalla, we're gone. Okay? That's this Midrash. It's very different Midrashim. One is Moshe is, ang- we'll call it angry at the people or has to, you know, fight with them to get them to move. The other one is, uh, they, le- they left voluntarily, and it's a praise for them. We would think that Rashi, based off of what I told you before, that he likes to praise B'nai Israel, that he would actually go with this perush. However, one thing is more important, and that's the pshat. And Rashi says here, Rashi, and notice how he also rewords the whole midrash. 
ויעשה משה חיסיאן בעל כורחם, שעטרו מצרים סוסיהם ותכשיטי זהב וכסף ואבנים טובות, והיו סוהר מוצאים אותם בים, או גדולה הייתה ביזה הים מביזת מצרים, זה צריך להיות נאמר מדרש, מי ביוזן היס טקסט, שנאמר, תורי זהב נעשה לך עם נקודות הכסף, לפי כך הוא צריך להעשיין בעל כורחם. Therefore, you have to do it against their will. Why is this, why is this pashat? Because that's what the, first of all, vayasa means he caused them to move. He caused them to move. I didn't just say vayisu, Moshe of Bnei Yisrael. Secondly, you're going to tell me Bnei Yisrael, according to this midrash, weren't complaining about being in the desert. And the next thing they do is complain about the desert. So for those reasons, the context and the, the grammar and the words and everything, Rashi chooses this midrash. But again, he's choosing it, he rewords it, and it just flows so beautifully how he writes it. He doesn't write this whole long midrash, which is nice, but he just summarizes it and puts it in a way that flows so much easier with the pasuk. Um, and he builds a storyline continuing, right? This story, this, this midrash contradicts what's going to happen in a little bit. So he doesn't want you to get all confused. So he picks this midrash. And, you know, Shalom Ha Yisrael, it's the Pshat. Okay, next time we'll bring about when he quotes Chazal but disagrees, and then we'll have different examples of uh, when he uh, just shows, he basically wants to his own interpretation, but he's like, if it's a Devrei Chachamim, there's nothing I could really do. So...